uh, first of all, on, on, uh, on, on the border and measures to... Uh, there, are, there are all sorts of things in the treaty that uh, you will recognise about trusted uh, trader schemes and uh, special measures on sanitary and phytosanitary uh, recognition and, and steps to uh, uh, make sure that you know, things flow as smoothly as we possibly can. Though again, I stress that there will be things that people have to do. Look, I mean, the, the, one of the great... The EU was, a, an ex, a, was and is an extraordinary concept, and it was born out of the agony of the, of the Second World War, uh, a, a founded by uh, idealistic people uh, in France and Germany uh, and Italy uh, who, who never wanted uh, those countries to go to war uh, with each other again and, and other countries, uh, Belgium, Holland, and others. And uh, in many ways, it's an, it was and is a very noble enterprise. Uh, so I, you know, I don't recognize that the kind of language that you, that you talk of. I, I think that the UK's own relationship with it was always difficult. Uh, we always found some of the the language about ever closer union, the idea of, uh, of this political uh, union, this very dense idea of, uh, of, of this ideology of endless integration, we found quite hard, George. And I think you, you know, as a, a fellow Brussels uh, reporter, you'll remember that there was, there was quite a lot of friction involved. I think that what we've got here is the basis of a new long-term friendship and partnership that basically stabilizes that relationship. And insofar as the UK needs to be, and always must be, a great European power, always must be, a great, great European power, where they're outside the main body of the, of the EU, but where they're as a friend and as a supporter, as a, as a, as a flying buttress, if you like, uh, that to, to make sure, as we have done so many times in the last uh, couple of hundred years, that we're able to lend our voice when it's uh, when it's needed and to be of, of value to our European friends and partners in a, in a strategic way. And that's what the UK will obviously continue to do. But I think the, the, the very dense program of integration wasn't right for the, for the UK. And that's why it was right to take back control in the way that we, that we have. And uh, I think that uh, this, deal, this deal expresses uh, what the people of the country uh, voted for. In, uh, in 2016, and I think there was a wisdom in what they decided, and uh, I think that we'll be able to go forward on this basis. Let's go to Gordon Rayner of The Telegraph. Thank you, Prime Minister, and uh, Merry Christmas for tomorrow. Um, could I just ask, uh, probably half the people watching this right now would have voted Remain uh, in the referendum in 2016. Uh, do you have a particular message for them? Uh, you know, people today are tweeting that uh, this is a, a bad deal, that it's not what they what they wanted. They would rather have stayed in. What's your message to them? Um, and just secondly, could I also ask you, we've had more figures today on COVID. You mentioned COVID earlier. Um, can you rule out uh, another national lockdown after Christmas? Uh, well, Gordon, thanks. I, mean, I think my message to everybody on both sides of the divide is I, uh, of that argument in 2016 is I really think we, it's now a long time behind us. And I think most people that I talk to, whichever way uh, they were inclined to vote back then, just want it settled and want us to move on. And I think this gives us the, the platform, uh, the foundation for a really prosperous new relationship. And I would be very excited uh, now by, by this, this deal. You know, this European question has been going on for decades. Uh, exactly what relationship uh, we should have. Uh, this is a, a, a great new free trade deal, uh, a, a trading relationship and partnership that I think will uh, bring prosperity to, to both sides of the channel. And um, on a, a coronavirus and uh, the, the, the struggle there, obviously we face a very considerable uh, new pressures, particularly from the, the 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 new variant and the speed with which that's been uh, that's been spreading, uh, we believe that uh, we're going to have to get through this tough period now. With, as I say, as I said many times, very tough restrictions with tough tiering, uh, and uh, you, you'll have seen what's been announced over the last uh, day or so about that. And and much as I regret that, I do think it is necessary. Uh, for us to grip this virus 
now to stop it running out of control uh, in, in January, uh, because we need to buy ourselves time to get the vaccine into as many arms uh, of the elderly and, and vulnerable as we can. And that is the, that is the real way in which we will uh, defeat the, the virus. So it's, it's, it's tough tiering, community testing, and, and rolling out the vaccine. And we're going we're to continue uh, with, with, with that approach. And uh, I, I know that uh, it, it's been very, very tough over the last uh, few weeks. And I must tell people it will continue uh, to be difficult, uh, not least but ba basically because of the, uh, the speed with which the new variant is, is spreading. But the vaccine is going into people's arms and there really is now, I think, a hope, uh, the certainty that uh, we will have it, uh, we will have it defeated, as I say, uh, by uh, by the spring. Or well, that's certainly what the scientists uh, still believe, and they're still uh, they're still confident of that. So, thanks very much, Gordon. Let's go to to Harry Cole of the Sun. Thank you, Prime Minister. Can you give us some more details about the new security arrangements with the EU? Are we going to be as safe uh, next week? In your, under your new security partnership, as we are today, given it's Brussels are saying that they're going to lock us out of live EU databases. And uh, given you've locked us all up, how will you uh, recommend we celebrate leaving the EU next week? Well, uh, Harry, look, I, I, I leave your, your, your manner of celebration entirely to, 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 to you and to individual taste. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, I mean, we've, I think it's done quite enough bossing people around, uh, recommending this or that over the last, uh, over the last. 10 months or so uh, but on on security and uh, police cooperation I'm you know absolutely confident this is a uh, a deal that protects our uh, police cooperation protects uh, our ability to uh, catch criminals and uh, to share intelligence across uh, the European uh, continent in the way that uh, we have done uh, for, for many years so uh, I, uh, I don't think people should have fears on that score, or indeed on any, any score. Uh, let's go to Heather Stewart of The Guardian. Hello, Prime Minister. Um, it, it, Michelle Barnier said today that we decided to leave the Erasmus exchange scheme, which sent thousands of students to EU countries every year. I wonder what you'd say to young people who feel as though opportunities to discover the continent on our doorstep by li li living there or studying there or working there are being taken away from them. Um, and secondly, just do you have a message for Keir Starmer, who will have to decide in the coming hours and days how to whip Labour MPs, whether, whether they should support your deal? Uh, right, uh, Heather, well, look, on, the, on, on Erasmus, it was a tough decision. Uh, the, the, the issue really was that, um, as you know, the, the, the UK is a massive net contributor to the continent's higher education economy, because uh, over the last uh, decades, we've... Uh, had so many uh, EU nationals, which we've, uh, it's been a wonderful thing, uh, uh, but our, our arrangements basically mean that financially the UK exchequer uh, more or less loses out on the, on, the, on the deal. Erasmus was also extremely uh, expensive. So what we're doing is uh, producing a, uh, a, a UK uh, scheme for students to go around the world. And uh, it'll be called the Turing uh, Scheme and it will so, so, so students will have the opportunity to, uh, and then after Alan Turing, so the students will have the opportunity not just to go to European uh, universities, but to go to uh, the best universities uh, in the world, because we want our, our young people to uh, experience uh, the uh, immense intellectual uh, stimulation of, uh, of, of Europe, but also of the, of the whole world. And as for, I think you, you asked about which way should the opposition vote on this, well, it's perfectly obvious. Uh, uh, Heather, the opposition should vote for this excellent deal, and uh, and I would strongly encourage uh, everybody uh, to do the same. Thank you very much, everybody. Happy Christmas to you all. Thank you. We have been listening to the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announcing a deal that has been reached with Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission, over Brexit, finally. He is hopeful that uh, Parliament will vote on it in a special session on December the 30th. Uh, he says that they have gotten an awful lot of what they wanted, that they are going to replace harmonization with free trade, and that will actually re have stronger relations between Britain and the EU. At the same time, they got past that pesky issue of fishing and said that at least for five years there'll be an arrangement, and after that it's all up to Great Britain. So now for an, really a rundown on how much 
Boris Johnson has uh, has to celebrate. We turn now to our colleague David Merritt in London. So, David, it looks like after four and a half years, they finally have a deal. Uh, is Prime Minister Johnson right to be as ebullient, I think I can say, as he was in this news conference? Yeah, well, he certainly was, wasn't he? Looking more cheerful than he has done of late with all the other terrible news that's been um, washing over the UK. I, he's certainly relieved to get this done. He's going to be painting it as a big win. The spin clearly has started from the British side, painting this as a big victory. And he was keen to point out some of the compromises that the European Union have made. And they certainly have made some. The British have also made an awful lot of compromises. But I thought it was interesting listening to him about what was left out when he was asked a couple of pointed questions there around the content of this deal, around some things that really matter to the British economy, namely financial services. You know, the UK is the biggest exporter of financial services in the world. And he mumbled a little bit the answer to that. He said, oh, well, in the text, there's some uh, good language around equivalence. That's going to be the rules whether the city of London can sell its services into the EU. Just some good language. No commitment there to what the arrangements might be. And the reports are that in fact the can on financial services being kicked further down the road. This deal isn't actually an agreement on that. So that in no way is going to be seen as a victory, certainly not uh, in the city of London. So that's just one example there. There's a lot of detail still to come out. And while Mr. Johnson may well spin this as a great triumph, and it certainly is uh, a victory personally for him to get this big trade deal uh, done just in the nick of time, I think we're going to see a lot more issues come out in the coming days when we get the text of this thing, um, perhaps later this evening. He said at one point the text was roughly 500 pages, so there's an awful lot in there. I'm sure it'll take some time to pour over. Do we have a sense, David, of what will change on January 1, assuming this is ratified by Parliament as well as by the EU? What will change as of January 1? Well, again, it depends who you talk to on this. Mr. Johnson there at the beginning of his comments Trump said that this is a no-tariff, no-quota agreement, and he also said there'll be no non-tariff barriers to trade. He was picked up on that by someone else who said, no, the Europeans are saying everything will change. It's not like being inside the single market. What does that mean? It means there will be paperwork for companies to complete if they're sending goods over the border. And we know that what that means is actually a lot of delays at port sites over, and we saw just this week what that means. It means backed up trucks up the, uh, the highway going into Dover and uh, uh, chaos and delays for trade. So that is what companies are worried about. The truth is that no one really knows. We're so close now to the end of the transition period. Businesses are still not really aware of what forms they need to do. They weren't sure whether there was going to be a no deal Brexit on that at that point, and they're not quite sure what the rules they're going to have to follow now are. Mr. Johnson, the press conference, said, well, everyone needs to go onto the, the government website to check. But, you know, it's Christmas Day tomorrow, and then companies have only got a week. So I'm afraid to say we, we do expect there's going to be some disruption um, at the ports, at the borders. A lot, you know, only a week for all the British companies to get used to these new arrangements of sending goods abroad. And Mr. Johnson can try to dodge that and say there's nothing but it. As I say, he was picked up on that and had to slightly row back his comments. We know that he sometimes says a few things uh, that might not actually stand up in fact. Um, and again, he's going to have to be a little bit careful about promising no disruption. And we'll have to see what actually happens next Friday night. Yeah, a lot, as you suggest, David, to pour over the next 10 days or so. Uh, David, one other question, and that is Boris Johnson is very proud in his news conference of saying we are out from under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. Is that clear? Because that was very important to a number of the people in the United Kingdom. Yes, that's right. And again, we, we're going to have to see the full details. The governance aspect of this was one of the big sort of flashpoints. Um, it seems that the um, any kind of disputes for this will be resolved by some form of independent arbitration, which doesn't refer back to the European Court of Justice. I suppose you could say that is a victory for the British side. If you remember Theresa May's deal that she was proposing back when she was prime minister, really did tie the UK uh, much more closely in to the um, European uh, uh, institutions and including the European Court of Justice. So this is definitely a big break from that. It seems the European Union have ceded ground, and you can expect him to trumpet this as one of his great victories in the coming days, when Parliament's going to be recalled from the middle of their Christmas break. There's going to be a vote on this in Westminster on December the 30th. But a couple of days before that, you can imagine him to, uh, he's going to shout loudly about this fact that Britain is no longer subject 
to the European Court of Justice. You know, but of course, in trade yeah. agreements, there's always a right. little bit of seeding of authority. And, you know, of course, the European Justice uh, Court of Justice has a role to play in setting European law. So it's not as clear cut as that. But no, I mean, definitely a right. big change. And one of the reasons why Mr. Johnson is looking so pleased today, I think. Yeah, he does seem to be very pleased. Thank you so much to our colleague David Merritt reporting from London. In the meantime, we want to turn now to Danny Blanchfire. He is professor of economics at Dartmouth, and he's a former member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Danny, thank you so much for jumping in on this. There's a lot still to be discerned to go through this 500-page document. But from what you've heard so far, is this good for the British economy or not so good? Well, I, I, I've been listening to my pal Adam Posen, who I think said it's really well. He said, it's like saying I had an amputation as scheduled but it turns out there was no post-op infection, so it could have been worse, but still not good. I mean, it, this clearly is, uh, it, in economic terms, this is a disaster. Um, I think Pascal Lamy, former head of the WTO, said it really well. This is the first free trade deal ever that reduces the amount of free trade. So that's the first thing. And the second thing, as a labor economist, free movement of peoples is what greases the wheels of the labor market. So I don't know what the analogy is, but it does the opposite. So it rusts up the wheels, it reduces mobility, it raises uncertainty for firms not knowing what happens at the border, and we've no idea what happens to, to, to services. So this is indubitably an utter disaster in economic terms. But I guess I would say, David, it could have been worse. I mean, a no-deal Brexit clearly would have been worse. But really, it looks like clearly at the time where you have a pandemic and a lockdown, this seriously lowers living standards. Uh, and as I say, the, the, and it's very interesting to hear Boris Johnson spin it. But this, I just can't see any economic benefits when you're within a free trade area and then you move outside it and you put yourself outside, outside the barrier. So I think this is pretty much the view of all economists. This looks like an utter disaster, but it could have been worse. <laughs> well, well said. At the same time, it comes at a very unfortunate time. Not that there's a good time for any disaster, right. but when we're all facing a pandemic, Britain is going through yet a further lockdown, which is really damaging the economy. So we're having the two of those come together almost yeah. in a perfect storm. As a labor economist, what is this going to do in employment in the UK? Well, I mean, the first thing I said to you is we've had, we've had people coming from Eastern Europe, we've had people coming into the UK and people leaving, which makes the economy function better. So that's going away. Um, essentially, we're also seeing a reduction in demand. I mean, with uncertainty, of, with the pandemic as well, firms have got people on furlough. So as far as I can see, this uncertainty means that they're unlikely to bring these folks back in. Unemployment is set to rise, and a group that I've talked a lot about is think about the young. So there's workers that are furloughed. They'll be the first in line to be pulled back. But economic activity is going to decline. So that just does not look good for, for employment, which has started to tick upwards. So, I mean, I'm just, just struggling to find the... I mean, if I was... In a sense, you asked the, the Prime Minister, so tell me any good news in the labor market, and, and I, I can't think of any. Wages aren't going to rise, unemployment's going to rise, underemployment's going to rise, firms are going to leave and go to Europe, and it raises the prospect that other parts of the country will leave. The Scots, I mean, I heard um, 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 people talking about the potential that, that's, that Scotland will, will leave, and I think this raises the prospect that the UK will break asunder, and firms are not going to invest with this great uncertainty. So um, I, I, I've struggled to see anything in economic terms that's beneficial whatsoever. So clearly there are some challenges ahead the way you look at it. Let's talk about what could be done about that. As I said, you were a member of the Monetary Policy Committee right. of the Bank of England. After the Brexit vote was taken, as I recall, the Bank of England stepped in fairly aggressively to really support the economy. Is yeah. there anything that the yeah. Bank of England can do in response to this now? Well, obviously, the, the limits that they've reached are that interest rates are at 0.1, um, and they are talking about potentially going negative. And the obvious question is, well, how far negative could they go? Um, really unclear. Um, quantitative easing seems important. The, the government has done pretty darn well with its furlough scheme, 
but we heard that it was extended until April. And we've heard, I mean, I was on a radio program for BBC the other day, and directly after me, Philip Hammond, an ex-chancellor, came in and started to talk once again about, oh, well, we've got to start paying for this. We've got to reintroduce austerity. Well, it was disastrous last time. Be completely disastrous this time, where you have the combination of the lockdown and then the uncertainty about Brexit. So hopefully that will not happen. But the, the potential that you you then start to tighten, you put in austerity post-April, looks like madness. I mean, I can't believe they haven't learned from what they did last time. In 2010, the Tories imposed um, austerity. That produced the slowest recovery in 300 years. And we have even bigger shocks now. The combination of the lockdown, COVID shock, and, and Brexit. Just think about the, the trucks lined up at the border at Dover, and the numbers are going to get bigger once this deal comes into place in January. And that means food shortages, um, prices of food rising. Um, I, I, it, it looks cataclysmic to me. Okay, Danny, I really appreciate your being with us. That's Professor Danny Blanchfire, Professor of Economics at Dartmouth. Thank you very much for being with us. Coming up here, we're going to come back to the United States and talk about stimulus that still weighs in the balance. With a former senior economic advisor to President Trump, he is Andrew Ullman. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Well, it may be Christmas time, but at least some people in Washington don't seem to be much in the Christmas spirit, as President Trump has now thrown a wrench in the works of that stimulus package, saying he doesn't think the payment to individuals is nearly high enough, and it's not clear whether it will go along or not. And then he said he's going to—he's vetoing the Defense Authorization Act, which may shut down the government. To take us through what is going on in Washington, particularly at the White House, we now welcome a former senior advisor, economic advisor to President Trump. He's Andrew Elman. He was deputy assistant to the president for economic policy, as well as deputy director of the National Economic Council. He is now with the law firm of Mayor Brown. So, Andrew, thank you so much, Andrew, for being with us. Let's start with stimulus. Uh, we now just learned today that, in fact, we're not going to get a, a, a vote in the House that will put forward the 2,000. The Republicans have stopped that. Where does the stimulus stand at the moment, and how important is it for the economy? Yeah, I, I think the stimulus is still on the one-yard one line and that we're pretty close to still getting a deal. There's certainly going uh, to be a few more back and forth between the different parties, but if you look at where they've come from uh, over the last really six months, they're, they're almost there. They haven't been that far apart, really, I think, in the negotiations for a while, and it was all you know coming close, close together. You know, certainly the president now has some concerns about the size of those stimulus checks, and they're going to have to work that out. But I'm still pretty optimistic that a stimulus bill is going get, to get, get completed, going to get enacted into law in the near, near term. It's always difficult to predict exactly when, but it, it's, it's coming, and that will be really good for the U.S. economy, especially small businesses who really need the uh, Paycheck Protection Program to, to revive up again and uh, start helping those small businesses who have really been hit uh, the hardest by, by the pandemic. So as I understand it, you were there, I believe, for the CARES Act. So you know how this works in Washington. As a practical matter, are we, uh, were we looking at December 28, perhaps? Because they tried to do unanimous consent. That didn't work because there were some Republicans. Now they can, they're talking about a roll call vote on December 28. Yeah, that's all being worked out right uh, worked out right now. You know, my experience on these these big bills, and this is definitely a big a big one. Um, that you usually run into some unexpected um, uh, turbulence along the way as you're kind of going in to kind of land the bill, so to speak, and it can take a little bit, you know. But in the grand scheme of things, I still think they're pretty close. Certainly, we have the funding deadline on Monday, and right now, my expectation is is that they're they're uh, in the Senate uh, trying to figure out where they want to go and whether or not they want to cut a deal on the stimulus checks, or if they'll stay uh, where uh, stay firm on $600 or want to make other changes. But those negotiations are all going on right now. I think the main thing for your viewers to know is, is that I still think a deal is, is likely in the near term. This is just part of the process. And, you know, somebody's worked on a lot of bills over the years. You know, this doesn't um, totally surprise me that we're uh, at the end of the year and there's a lot of haggling going on over this bill. That's a pretty common uh, uh, outcome in Washington. Certainly going over 
the Christmas holiday is, we haven't done that in a while, um, but still the overall process is still the same. That last minute negotiations to, fi to finalize a really important bill. So that's, that's pretty standard in Washington. So stay, I st remain optimistic. Uh, so, so, Andrew, uh, how about keeping funding going for the government? Because we have the NDAA, that National Defense yeah. Authorization Act, that the president now has vetoed. And as yeah. I understand it, that could well shut down the government because they're going to run out of funding. Yeah, and that will depend on what, if there's a veto override on Monday. Um, you know, vetoes are, uh, in the post-war period, a pretty common part of our process, and they just haven't been... I think this, uh, you know, we've had so many deals that have been worked out uh, recently, we've kind of forgot the role of a veto sometimes. But Congress, you know, now has a chance to override the veto. It looks like they, they may have the votes to do that, so we should know on Monday. You know, my expectation is is either they'll they'll see if they have the votes for overriding the veto, um, and, but if they don't, they'll, they'll pass a quick short-term extension for, for federal funding to avoid uh, a shutdown. What about the president's claim that there's a lot of pork in this? I mean, the president is uh, objecting to the not repealing the Section 230 of the Communications Act, uh, but he also is saying there's a lot of, lot of money in there that shouldn't be. Is that pretty much typical, though, when we're funding the government? Usually there's a lot of things in there that maybe you wouldn't want. Well, yeah, certainly in these bills, the, um, uh, there are a lot of priorities that get, get put, in, put in there, and sometimes, you know, the, um, you know, presidents don't agree with some of the priorities of Congress. Again, that's all part of the back-and-forth process. You know, certainly the 230 liability shield issue was kind of the foremost issue that he has signaled for a long time now that he wanted to see included in that legislation and that a veto um, could come uh, if it wasn't included. So I wasn't surprised that he vetoed it uh, uh, at all um, because of that fact. It's a, you know, it's a longstanding policy priority for him. Is he concerned about what this is going to do to GDP growth? That was a priority for this president when he came in, and he had some real progress on that for a while. Obviously, the pandemic threw a curveball. Is he concerned about that? Well, listen, I think the, the, the stimulus is critical for uh, getting the economy uh, back up uh, to where it was a year ago. You know, as you correctly pointed out, the economy had gotten to a really uh, great place with record low uh, unemployment uh, uh, rates across all demographics, you know, finally getting the GDP growth uh, uh, above 3%. three I think the economy can go back to that um, if we, once we get through the, this pandemic. And that's why I see the, this additional round of the stimulus uh, is pretty important for helping us kind of bridge that gap. Now that we've got a vaccine coming out, you know, it does look like the public health side of this crisis is getting to a, a better place. We just need a little bit more time on the economic side. You know, the economic side has to buy a little bit more time for the public health side before the economy can kind of get back, back, back to normal. So, you know, you know, I think we yeah. all want to cross our fingers that we, we, this vaccine works. Yeah, as people have said, a bridge to that time when the vaccine works. Thank you so much. Really great to have you with us. Hope Thanks, you have buddy. a great holiday. That's Andrew Ullman of Mayor Brown, former senior economic advisor to President Trump. Coming up, we get the views of Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, on the stimulus plan. What should be in there, maybe what shouldn't be in there. That's coming up next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. Larry Summers, the former Secretary of Secretary, has long supported another round of stimulus. But when we talked to him yesterday, he wasn't sure that we needed those $2,000 per person payments that President Trump wants. We're better off with stimulus than we are without stimulus. I don't think the $2,000 checks uh, make much sense. The real issue is going to be sustaining this expansion. You think about it, the 908 stimulus bill probably would pay out 200 to $250 billion a month for the next three months. The level of compensation is running about $30 billion a month below what we would have expected it would. GDP is running about $70 billion a month below what we would have expected it would. So in a way that's quite unprecedented, we have stimulus already much more than filling out the hole. And given that lots of the hole is from the fact not that people don't want to spend, but that they can't spend because they can't take a flight or they can't go to a restaurant, I don't necessarily think that the priority should be on promoting consumer spending beyond where we are now. 
So I'm not even sure that I'm so enthusiastic about the $600 checks. And I think taking them to $2,000 would actually be a pretty serious mistake that would risk a temporary overheat. I would like to see more assistance to state and local governments. I would like to see more money put into testing, uh, more money put into accelerating uh, vaccines. But gosh, David, I think it would be a real mistake to be going to uh, $2,000. And I have to say that when you see the two extremes agreeing, you can almost be certain that something crazy is in the air. And so when I see a coalition of Josh Hawley, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump getting behind an idea, I think that's time to run for cover. And um, I know that many of my fellow Keynesians who believe in fiscal stimulus will likely um, be in favor of this, but sometimes there can be too much, too poorly designed of even a basically good idea. And that's my reaction to $2,000 stimulus. Well, it's not massive the way a move to $2,000 a person would be, but when you talk about maybe poorly designed, we've got a 5,600 page bill, give or take here. A lot of stuff in there, probably nobody knows is quite what's in there. But it, you've had a chance to look at some of it now. Are there some things that really jump out at you and say, boy, that doesn't make much sense to me? There are two things that strike me as really uh, big time dumb. Uh, the first is the resurrection of the three martini lunch. That was repealed by like the Reagan administration on principle that why should uh, the company canteen not be tax deductible when you when you eat there and fat cat executive lunches um, be deductible uh, for all concerns and not treated as uh, income. We put it back for two years. That's beyond where people think this pandemic's gonna be. The reason they put it back for two years was because they knew that once it had been there for two years, it was gonna be hard not to uh, keep extending. So I think that qualifies as the worst tax provision of the decade. And it's a decade that's seen some real doozies. The other one, uh, the other one, David, where it doesn't make much sense is if you get a PPP loan, and so you don't bear any expense for a portion of your payroll, why should you get to deduct a payment you didn't make? Or equivalently, if the government's going to give you money, how come that's not being called income? And so that sort of overpayment seems to me to be another thing that's just a straight out uh, giveaway. And make no mistake, these things are not there by accident. These things are there because people put them there. And they're there then because other people didn't have the courage to resist them, even though they knew uh, that they were wrong. That was former Treasury Secretary Larry H Summers, now of Harvard. We'll have more of my conversation with Larry Summers coming up on Wall Street Week. That airs tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Ritika Gupta. Thanks, David. The deal is done. Those words today from British Prime Minister Boris Johnson after the UK clinched a historic trade deal with the European Union. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen called it the right and responsible thing to do for both sides. This agreement is in the United Kingdom's interest. It will set solid foundations for a new start with a long-term friend. 
and it means that we can finally put Brexit behind us. The agreement comes days before the UK is due to leave the bloc single market and customs union. Parliament will vote on the plan on December the 30th. House Republicans have shot down Democrats' move to boost payments to most Americans as part of a coronavirus relief package. President Trump had demanded the payments be increased from $600 to $2,000, and Democrats hoped to get that approved by unanimous consent. But Republicans blocked the attempt. Democrats will try again next week with a roll call vote. And the U.S. now leads the world when it comes to the number of people receiving the coronavirus vaccine. More than 1.1 million doses have been given in the first 10 days the shot was available. Three states have vaccinated more than 1% of their populations, North Dakota, West Virginia and Alaska. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Ritika. We turn now to Israel. Israel is entering its third shutdown of the pandemic and is about to have its fourth election in the last two years. To put this all in some perspective for us, we welcome now Danny Danan. He is the former permanent representative of Israel to the United Nations, and he is chairman of World Likud. So, Ambassador Danan, thank you very much for being with us. Let's start with that election. The government has fallen, as I understand it, over a dispute over the budget. What is really at stake here? Is it the budget or are there more fundamental issues that require Israelis to go back to the polling places so frequently these days? Thank you for having me, David. Indeed, we are heading for the fourth election within two years, unfortunately. We have to admit that, that nobody is happy about that. But this is the price of a democracy. Israel is a vibrant, strong democracy. Uh, and we go by the rules of democracy. And unfortunately, the current government uh, cannot build a coalition to pass a budget, and that is why we are heading for a new election. I hope that uh, after the election, we will have a definite answer uh, about the coalition, uh, because the last thing we need is to have a, a cycle of uh, elections. It is not good for our economy. It is not good for governing. And also in terms of fighting uh, COVID, uh, we need now the energy to go to this issue and not to political fights. Will this fourth election be yet another contest between Bibi Netanyahu on the one hand and Benny Gantz on the other? Because they've gone at it several times now. I, I believe it will be the case. But now the, it will be something different. It will not be left and right anymore. You will see more parties on the right, but half of the parties on the right will not support the prime minister. So basically, if in the past people always saw Labour and Likud running against one each other, that will not be the case uh, this time. I'm not sure about blue and white also. So you will have few right-wing parties. Half of them will support the prime minister, and the second half will say we will not go with the prime minister. In the meantime, we are having our own transition, as you know, here in the United States. We have a president-elect Biden now about to come in. Give us a perspective from Israel's point of view about the issues that you think might be coming up with a President Biden once he takes office January 20. I think it's fair to say, our impression at least, is that uh, President Donald Trump was perceived as a friend to the Israeli government. First, we have to, to acknowledge it. President Trump uh, was a great friend for the state of Israel, for the people of Israel. He did great things, pulling out from the Iran deal, moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, the Abraham Accords, now that we have the uh, peace uh, treaties with the uh, uh, four new Arab countries. So we are grateful for that. But I am sure we will be able to work with the new administration as well. Uh, at the UN, I had the, the honor to work with both administrations in the past, and we know how to work with the Democrats as well. It will not be as easy as it was. It will require more efforts from Israel, but uh, I'm sure we will continue to promote our common values. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Iranian deal, and uh, President-elect Biden has made it clear he would like to re restart that agreement again, perhaps with some modifications in the terms. Uh, what is the Israeli position on that? Is it possible to come back to the bargaining table with Iran and have a deal that Israel would be comfortable with? So, David, this is the main issue that we have to, to look at, and uh, we will look at it very carefully, because for us it's, it's a matter of life or death. We, we cannot make any mistakes on the, the nuclear Iran agenda. So for us, it will be the first thing on the, on the agenda when we discuss it with our uh, colleagues in Washington. And, uh, and I think our approach should be 
that uh, we should not uh, encourage anyone to sign agreement with the Iranians. We know that they are lying. They are breaching the agreement they signed already. And it's not us saying it. Those countries uh, that signed the JCPOA acknowledge that the Iranians are lying all the time. So we believe that uh, the U.S. should apply more pressure, more sanctions, and that is the only way to actually lead them or force them uh, to make a change. But in the meantime, as I understand it, Iran, because the United States has pulled out of it, is enriching uranium at a much faster pace, is really almost restarting its weapons program. Uh, isn't that more dangerous? Don't we need to deter them somehow? And thus far, sanctions have not really done that trick, have they? Um, I, I beg to differ with you. Uh, I think they were doing it no matter what. But now maybe they're doing it publicly in order to show uh, to the Western democracy that they uh, it was a mistake to pull out from the agreement, but they did it in the past, and we revealed it when we actually found the archive in Tehran, and, and we shared it with our allies. So their intentions from the beginning was uh, to lie, uh, and they are a master of deception, and they proved it in the past. So I think more pressure, more sanctions will lead them to actually sit down and negotiate a, a deal that will be able to enforce and it will actually will bring them back to where they should be. So, so Ambassador Janan, uh, you mentioned the Abraham Accords, and certainly under the Trump administration, progress was really made between Israeli relations with some Arab uh, countries in the neighborhood, most recently Morocco, actually. Uh, do, are you hopeful that can continue under a Biden administration? Would that be a priority for them? And by the way, what about Saudi Arabia? So I believe that the Biden administration will continue with the momentum. It's good for Israel. It's good for the allies of the U.S. in the region, but it's also good for the U.S. So now we have an agreement with the UAE, with Bahrain, Sudan, and now Morocco. I believe we will see more countries joining the, the club of peace in the region, uh, maybe Oman, Tunisia, and maybe even Saudi Arabia, a very important player in the region. And I think in the long run, David, it will actually lead the Palestinians to acknowledge reality, to recognize Israel, and to sit down and negotiate with us, maybe together with our new friends in the region. So I think in the long term, it is good for the Palestinians, even though they are condemning what we are seeing now. The Palestinians have sort of gotten pushed off to the side, I think it's fair to say, in these negotiations. Uh, is the two-state solution gone? So there is a new paradigm today. In, in the past, the paradigm was, first, Israel should solve the problem with the Palestinians, and only then, uh, we can have a dialogue with the moderate Arab countries. Today, we shifted the paradigm. We're building bridges to the moderate Arab countries. And I believe they will in allow us to start negotiating with the Palestinians. And I think it is a reality check for the Palestinians. That's why I think we can speak about the outcome once we negotiate with the Palestinians. But the challenge is, is actually to force them to come back to the negotiating room. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, really appreciate your time today. That is Ambassador Danny Danan, former permanent representative from Israel to the United Nations. Meanwhile, coming up here, we're going to talk about that massive cyber attack from Russia with the man who was the coordinator for the State Department on cybersecurity. He is Christopher Payton. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. I'm David Weston. Just about everybody, apart from President Trump, seems to agree that there was a massive problem with the cyber attack and the Russians were behind it. But President-elect Biden has no hesitation about whose fault that is. The Trump administration failed to prioritize cybersecurity. It did that from eliminating or downgrading cyber coordinators in both the White House and at the State Department, to firing the Director of Cyber, Space, and Infrastructure Security Agency, to President Trump's irrational downplaying of the seriousness of this attack. Enough's enough. 
We welcome now an expert on cybersecurity. He serves as the top U.S. diplomat in the State Department dealing with cybersecurity is Christopher Painter. And that was both under the Obama administration and the Trump administration as well. So, Mr. Painter, thank you so much for joining us. Give us your take on how big a problem this is and how much the U.S. government is reacting or perhaps even underreacting. Well, it's a huge issue, and, and we still don't know the full scope of this. It seems like another victim, another victim agency, another victim company uh, is being uh, uh, discovered every day. And I think we're going to see that for a number of weeks now, because this is a very sophisticated uh, and very, I think, uh, widespread intrusion into a number of systems. Now, this looks like uh, the goal was espionage and not a more destructive attack. It would be much more even serious if it was a destructive attack. We don't really know, though, because uh, these actors, Russia, got into these systems. Uh, and then uh, looks like they took lots of information. We don't know if they plan to do other things. So it is incredibly significant. It's incredibly significant because uh, all of the resources that we poured into cybersecurity so far, which I'd argue are not nearly enough, were not able to detect or stop this. And it just indicates that this really has to be a core priority, not just a boutique issue, not just this technical issue that most people treat it as, but a core national security economic and diplomatic priority for our country uh, and for businesses as well. And I think that's what you heard uh, a vice president or a president-elect Biden say uh, during that speech, which I think is very important. So, so let's talk about that. Uh, you know the inside of the U.S. government when it comes to cybersecurity very well. If you were recommending to president-elect Biden what should be done, you just said more money is one issue, more, have to be more resources. What about the structure? Your position at state, as I understand it, was eliminated. There was a similar coordinator position for cybersecurity at the White House that was eliminated. Uh, the person who was a DHS, Dep Department of Homeland Security, was knocked out of his job by President Trump. So what do we need in terms of structure in the U.S. government to deal with cybersecurity? Yeah, and structure is important because it shows leadership within the government. It shows leadership to the private sector. And, and for our friends, it's a rallying point, but for our adversaries, it shows weakness if we don't have a strong structure. So as you said, and as uh, a president like Biden said, the Trump administration got rid of the uh, cybersecurity uh, coordinator, sort of the, uh, the leader of the orchestra at the White House, the person who would uh, make sure that all the different agencies were coordinated in their response and in their protection. Uh, that's something I helped create when I was in the Obama administration and then got rid of my position, which was created in 2011, the first cyber diplomat really in the world. And those positions, I think, were really important. And of course, at DHS too, uh, firing Chris Krebs, all of those positions were important to making sure that we were prepared and coordinated. And unfortunately, that sent a message. And I think the, the other big problem that we had under the Trump administration is there, were good, there was good work by a number of people in the administration, to be sure. Uh, however, it never got the priority. It never got the recognition it needed. A DHS, really, immigration was the top priority, and cyber was way down the list. Uh, and you had President Trump uh, continually doubting whether the Russians were involved in malign cyber activity with election interference, with a big cyber worm called NotPetya that uh, affected Maersk and other uh, businesses around the world. And with this latest event where he said, I don't think it's Russia, I think it's China, worth no evidence to that uh, at all. So. That, that undercutting that message, not having a strong, consistent message, uh, only emboldens our adversaries, including in this case Russia, to go after us harder and not to really fear that the U.S. will do anything about it. Uh, so as you say, you know, the two things we need to do is do a much better job of protecting our systems. Not easy. You know, the attacker always has the advantage over the defender because the defender has to defend everything and the attacker only has to go after what they're, they want to. And it's a nation state, a sophisticated nation state. But we also have to make sure there are consequences for bad actors. And that means you know, messaging from the top saying this is unacceptable. And that means carrying through with consistent uh, actions. They could be economic sanctions, diplomatic actions, a range of things that we should do with our allies and partners. And that's where I really do expect this new administration to not really, not just recreate the structure, which I think they absolutely will do, uh, but they will also, I right. think, make this more of a priority and build on that. And finally, how important is that whatever action be taken be taken publicly as opposed to privately? This is not the first time Russia or others have attacked us. Sometimes I understand we responded privately as opposed to publicly. Sure, you got you can do both, but I think you have to at least have some public events, uh, public things you're doing. You remember back during the Sony Pictures attack uh, many many years ago uh, by North Korea, President Obama at that time said we'll take action both public and seen and unseen. I think is what he said. Well, that's fine. But I think you need to have some public actions that clearly demonstrate to the rest of the world and to our adversaries, including Russia, but others who are on the fence and may be acting against us in the future if we don't act against Russia, 
uh, that this is unacceptable. So you need to do both. Okay, really appreciate your time today, and I hope you have a good holiday. That's Christopher Painter. He's the former cybersecurity coordinator for the Department of State. Coming up here, more on our conversation with Dr. Anthony Fauci about how we've gotten ourselves into this dramatic surge in COVID here in the United States. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. There's a major COVID surge right across the country. And when we talked with Dr. Anthony Fauci of NIH yesterday, we asked him whether we're having that surge because we didn't do enough to fight it or whether this disease is just too difficult for us to get our arms around. This virus is really unprecedented in the last 102 years in its ability to spread in an extraordinarily efficient manner. It is a highly contagious virus. So even under the best of circumstances and the best of preparation, we still would be having a problem with this. And yes, there are things that we could have done better. We could have had a more uniform, consistent response that I have been talking about for some time now, instead of having multiple states doing things differently and not necessarily adhering to some of the guidelines that have been put forth about how to contain the virus and how to gradually and prudently open up the country and reopen up the economy. Which raises the question of why has the United States done relatively much worse, certainly in the deaths per millions, than some other countries on the world, certainly Taiwan or South Korea or China or even Germany. And it's not, the numbers I've seen are not just like 20% worse, it's five, six, seven times worse. What is that about? Is that the nature of our society? Is it a cultural issue? It is a leadership issue? What gave rise to that? Yeah. You know, as I said in answer to your prior question, it, it's probably a little bit of all of the above. You know, first of all, our country is very different than some of those countries. If you look at New Zealand and Australia and Taiwan, they have the capability of just closing down things and not having an input. We're in a gigantic country, 330 million people, diversity across the entire country, geographically, climate-wise, cultural-wise, population-wise. You know, we have Wyoming and we have New York City. It, there's such a, a degree of difference. I think one of the key issues that has been very problematic is that one of the beauties of the United States of America is that it is the United States of America. It's a federalist system, and states can and do things according to their own independence. Uh, and that in some respects is very good because there's enough differences in the states. You wanna give them the leeway to do that. However, when you're dealing with a pandemic infectious disease, you wanna do things in a way that is consistent so that everybody's pulling together in the same direction as opposed to different states, different regions, different areas doing things differently. It makes it very difficult to get a cohesive response when everybody's doing it a little bit differently. I think that's really been one of the stumbling blocks in our response to this pandemic. It's a stumbling block also an underinvestment in public health in this country. I've heard it said by some economists, we overinvest in private health and underinvest in public health. Well, they're absolutely correct. I mean, we had a reasonably good local public health system decades and decades ago when we had a lot of tuberculosis and respiratory illnesses and sexually transmitted disease as a victim of our own success, as we had uh, vaccines and antibiotics, uh, it became clear that we were doing a great job. So we let the public health systems essentially go to a trit. I mean, there was a lot of attrition of what normally was a robust system. There's gonna be a lot of lessons learned in all of this. One of them is to rebuild our local public health systems. Looking in the long term, is this going to be a chronic illness for the for the human population? I say, is this going to be more like polio or smallpox we can eradicate and it's gone, or is it going to be something we're going to have to deal with every year in one form or another? 
Well, I don't think we're going to eradicate it. In all of history, we've only eradicated one human virus, and that's smallpox. I believe that we can control and likely eliminate it in certain countries, and that is going to be totally dependent upon the uptake of vaccines. I mean, we eliminated polio in our country. We eliminated, with few exceptions of sections that don't do it, namely measles. We've eliminated a number of other infections in this country. I believe that we could do it. Elim elimination is different than eradication. Eradication will be difficult to do. So finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't wish you happy birthday. Tomorrow's your birthday, as I understand it. It'll be, you've said a different birthday. Uh, you're not gonna be with your daughters. It's gonna be Zooming instead of other things. Looking back on a remarkable career, you've served under Republican presidents, Democratic presidents, all of the above. Is this the most challenging year for you in your position? I mean, or have there have been other years almost as difficult? Well, there have been other groups of years uh, that have been difficult. I mean, HIV AIDS in the first several years was very tough. We had a very intense situation with Ebola. We had pandemic flu. We've had the anthrax attacks when we thought it was really bioterrorism and it was a homegrown person who did it. But I can say honestly that for the intensity of what we've gone through in a truncated period of less than a year that has immobilized the whole planet both from a public health and an economic standpoint, I would say that this really stands out as really one of the, if not the most challenging 11 month period that I've ever been through. That was Dr. Anthony Fauci of NIH. That was t recorded yesterday. Today is the day, so happy birthday, Dr. Fauci. Coming up, Real Yield and the Market Close. They're going to be talking to Michael Kelly of Pinebridge, as well as Jason Thornburg of Thornburg Investment Management. That does it for Balance of Power. I'm David Weston, and this is Bloomberg.